What big, amazing thing have you done this past week for Jesus? What was that? Hmm. That's what I thought. Probably nothing. And uh, how do you feel about that? Well, you should feel normal. <laughs> we dispelled that myth, right? The myth of the one great thing in week one, that, that your goal in life isn't to find one thing God puts you on this earth to do, because, well, it doesn't exist. I mean, possibly you found your passion and things are going well, and that's great. But nowhere does God say there is one great thing he's called you to do. Rather, every face you meet, every place you go, every space you occupy is a potential calling from God. And beyond that, God doesn't really have any expectations on you to do big, amazing, great things on some sort of regular basis. I mean, they sound good, don't they? It's kind of a good marketing technique. Do big things for Jesus. Might motivate you, or it might just make you feel guilty that you haven't already done those things. This is a trick of the devil. No, not that doing big things for the sake of the gospel in order to love and serve your neighbors isn't the problem. It's just that perhaps that's not the calling God has given you. And that's okay. When Jesus gave the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations, I mean, that sounds like a pretty big calling, doesn't it? And it's true, you're a part of it. But that commission wasn't just given to you or to any one person or for only the 12 disciples. Christ gave this to the church. And if you're a part of the church, which you are, then you're already on mission. You're already a part of this commission. And what we'll discover today is that you're already doing your part. No matter how big or small, no matter how glorious or mundane it might seem. You see, as Pastor Leininger highlights in this chapter, in Callings in Life, the various things God has given you, these things are better understood in the ordinary, everyday even mundane things of life, rather than the dramatic, extraordinary, mountaintop experiences. Those moments are good, but 99% of all life happens in the ordinary. And what's even more fascinating is that's precisely where God locates himself. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Christ put on human flesh, walked the earth, For 30 or so years, he laughed, he cried, he ate, he drank, he suffered, he died, he rose again. Now, certainly Christ had mountaintop experiences, quite literally, in fact. Two in particular. One, his transfiguration, where on the mountain, God's glory was revealed in Jesus. So if there was any doubt that he was the Son of God, well, it was put to rest there. So amazing was this mountaintop experience, in fact, that Peter wants to stay there, pitch his tent, and just be there forever. But where does Jesus direct him to go instead? That's right, back down to the ground, back down to the people who needed to be loved and served and told about Jesus. And the other, the most obvious mountaintop experience of Jesus, which, by the way, is kind of the opposite of how we would define such a term, is Mount Calvary. On that mountain, Jesus certainly wasn't on vacation. He was hard at work. But, and and forgive me if this sounds crass, but even on the cross, on that mountain, wasn't where Jesus was going to stay. Instead, he went not just to the ground after the cross, but into the ground. You know, earlier in Jesus' ministry, he told his disciples this would happen. Jesus described his his death and burial as as a seed going into the dirt. You know, a, a seed sitting on a shelf serves no purpose. But only when it's buried, completely underground, does it complete the cycle and bring forth the new life it was intended to. Big things, big moments, mass gatherings, all of those are important. But for us, That's not where we spend most of our time. 
Instead, we hang out with real people. We go through the ups and the downs, doing the everyday things for the good of one another. Those are the callings that you have each and every day. And it's in those ordinary moments that God uses them to do something extraordinary. His love and provision for his children across the world is done through you. Changing diapers, driving your child to school, doing the dishes, washing laundry, folding it, putting it away, washing, folding, putting it away, washing, folding, putting it away. Those mundane, repetitive, seemingly mindless tasks are actually real-life callings that matter. I've shared this story with a few people in a few different settings, and I want to share it with you. Uh, I heard a pastor friend read something out of this book called Every Moment Holy, and I thought what he shared was, was really profound, so I ordered this book. Uh, it's a book of liturgies or prayers rooted in Scripture for some every, everyday things, right? There's, there's liturgies in here for days of doubt, liturgies and prayers before you serve others and for families. And so I was excited to get this. Uh, and when I was arriving, uh, I started to thumb through it. Uh, and, and I started to look at all the various chapters in here. And then, and then I kind of changed my mind. I thought, this is, this is kind of ridiculous. This, this is, seems kind of silly. I saw things in here like liturgies for washing windows or setting up a Christmas tree or a liturgy for the changing of diapers. And not only was there one liturgy for diapers, there were two. <laughs> now, I almost set this book on my shelf, resigning it just to be decorative. But then I decided I should read one just to give it a fair shot. I, I chose the diaper one just to see what it was all about. And I was amazed. In fact, I was a bit embarrassed because after reading it, I, I found myself with wet eyes. So I'm going to read it for you now. And... I've read this enough now that hopefully I'll be able to control myself, but but who knows? And even though we in our household have been out of the diaper phase for quite some time now, and perhaps many of you are too, I, I still think you'll find it relevant and significant to what we're talking about today. So here it is, a liturgy for changing diapers, part one. Heavenly Father, in such menial moments as this, the changing of a diaper I would remember this truth. My unseen labors are not lost. For it is these repeated acts of small sacrifice that, like bright ragged patches, are slowly being sewn into a quilt of loving kindness that swaddles this child. I'm not just changing a diaper. By love and service, I am tending a budding heart that rooted in such grace-filled devotion might one day be more readily inclined to bow to your compassionate conviction, knowing itself then as both a receptacle and reservoir of heavenly grace. So this little act of diapering, though in form sometimes felt as base drudgery, might better be described as one of 10,000 acts, by which I am actively creating a culture of compassionate service and selfless love to shape the life of this family and this beloved child. So take this unremarkable act of necessary service, O Christ, and in your economy, let it be multiplied into that greater outworking of worship and of faith, a true investment in the incremental advance of your kingdom across generations. Open my eyes that I might see this act for what it is, from the fixed vantage of eternity. To see, O Lord, how the changing of a diaper might sit upstream of the changing of a heart. How the changing of a heart might sit upstream of the changing of the world. Amen. Almost. Almost. (laughs) Here's something to ponder. Anyone who has ever done anything, big or small, had someone early in their life changing their diapers. Changing a diaper is not a glorious task by any means, but it is part of a glorious and divine calling to love even when things stink or get messy. We heard Jesus say from our readings this morning that you and me, we are the salt 
of the earth and the light of the world. Salt and light are two common, ordinary, everyday things we probably don't think much about each day unless they're absent, right? Sipping chicken noodle soup before salt's added is quite a different experience than eating it after. It's pretty bland. And it's pretty rare that any of us are absolutely without light of any kind for any considerable amount of time. Even if the power goes out at night and it's overcast at the same time, there's always a little light shining through somewhere. If you've ever experienced the complete absence of light, though, you know it and you feel it. What's my point? Well, life would be drastically different if we didn't have these normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill, mundane elements in our life. They are ordinary, but they are extraordinarily important. Now, there's a lot of different ways we can think about the salt that Jesus talks about. There are dozens of interpretations on what exactly Jesus means, but for today, we'll focus on just one. Now, when you hear Jesus talking about salt, your mind probably goes right to table salt, right? The stuff in your kitchen, the stuff that makes food taste good and preserves it. Sodium chloride, this chemical compound, is extremely stable. And it wouldn't be able to lose its saltiness even if it tried. Salt does what salt does. And if it loses its saltiness, well, perhaps it wasn't salt in the first place. Now, interestingly, the, the Greek word used for lost its flavor is moraino, which means to become foolish. In fact, we get the English word moron from this same word. So it's possible that Jesus is doing a bit of a stand-up comedy routine here when he's teaching what it means to be disciples. It's impossible and quite ridiculous to think that salt could lose its saltiness. Salt does what salt does. It flavors and preserves. So if we interpret Jesus' teaching in the same way, a disciple will do what a disciple does. He flavors and preserves. Flavors by sprinkling love and compassion while at the same time serving his neighbor. And preserves by sharing the gospel of Jesus. The good news that we are saved by Christ's righteousness, completely covering us and savoring us for eternity. And in the same way, you are light. It's ridiculously impossible for a city on a hill to remain hidden. To this day, we even have a term for this, light pollution, especially prevalent in big cities like Chicago or New York, where even if you're miles away and out of range to see the buildings at night with your eyes, you know it's there because of the aura of light surrounding it. And Jesus says no one lights a lamp in their house just so that they can try and hide it under a basket. No. Rather, you set it up high on a stand on purpose so that the light might light the whole house. Salt cannot help but be salt and do what salt does. Light can't help but be light and do what light does. A disciple of Christ cannot help but be a disciple of Christ and do what Christ does. And what does Christ do? He serves. He loves and serves his people, the people that God put in his path. Regardless of their occupation or status or condition, Christ's work on earth is not necessarily what we call glorious. Certainly it wasn't glamorous. It was the opposite. But, but Jesus did all of those things with joy for what lay on the other side of it all. Christ's suffering and death was done out of love for you. Now, this chapter from this book, and I highly encourage you to read it, and if you don't have the book, to get it. This chapter, Diapers and Sippy Cups, I think is essential for understanding the whole of the book and the lesson it aims to teach, that our callings all begin, and for the most part stay, in the ordinary. You can take heart that although Christ had all of heaven as his glorious home, and, and though he could have simply stayed there, he didn't. He deliberately entered our world. He became a part of his creation. He took on flesh and lived among us and with us. Sure, I suppose in, in one way, the Son of God could have just snapped his fingers and done what he needed to do, but he didn't. Instead, he did what was necessary for us to live with him forever. He didn't come and, and get right to business. He took his time. He lived, he laughed, he cried, he taught, 
He ate, he drank, he cared for, he loved, he died, he rose. He did, he, he does life with us. And to this day, where is Christ to be found? Well, he locates himself in ink on a page, water in a basin, simple bread and wine. Through these ordinary elements, God makes you glorious. And Christ is found in diapers and sippy cups. He's found in hugs and band-aids and kissed boo-boos. He's found in hard workers and honest employees. He's found in good sportsmanship and valiant efforts. He's found in all those things because he's found in you. Or rather, you are found in him. And because you are in him, you are glorious. Because Christ can't help but be who he is. Our glorious, righteous, loving, kind, forgiving Savior and Lord. Amen.